so I had a cancer biology professor who was showing us this, is showing us all the plants that we were eating, just the normal fruits and vegetables that we would eat mm -hmm. and how toxic they were and how, how many carcinogens they had and yeah. how Brussels sprouts had 136 known carcinogens. Mushrooms had over 100, spinach, kale, broccoli, lettuce, cabbage, celery, cabbage, cucumber, all the different fruits and vegetables that we would eat had 60, 80, or over 100 known carcinogens. And they were quite abundant that um, we knew that there were um, roughly 10,000 times as many toxic components, like toxic chemicals that the plants made themselves naturally by weight than the pesticides we sprayed on them. So what is your medical background actually? Like what did you study and what do you practice at the moment? So I'm, well, I did my, yeah, my undergraduate degree in molecular and cellular biology and then went to medical school at the Royal College of Surgeons and um, was specializing in neurosurgery, but I left my original program for a family emergency. I was back helping my folks out in Seattle and I was doing humanitarian work in Bangladesh volunteering in the refugee camps there with the Rohingya refugees that were escaping genocide in Burma. There's an actual genocide in Burma. The yeah. uh, Burmese government, uh, now called Myanmar, um, unofficial numbers slaughtered about 200,000 people in a month. And about a million people fled into Southern Bangladesh and elsewhere to, to escape that. Yeah. And so I was helping those people um, that, that had come over there. And obviously Bangladesh is already extremely impoverished and, needs a lot of help anyway. So I was working with a local charity that was helping just the people of Bangladesh, but they were in the right, they were just right next to the refugee camps. And so they were helping with that as well. Yeah. And so I went down to help them and um, doing that. It was pretty crazy. You know, not many people were going there because they didn't really know about it because it wasn't one, like one of the highly publicized, um, sexy humanitarian crises. It was just a real one, you know, it was like Haiti or Nepal where everyone was flying yeah. over there to try to help. Um, this was um, just, a, just a bit of a disaster, but no one was publicizing it, probably because they didn't want to embarrass the Myanmar president because she was the first su supposedly democratically elected leader of Burma since it, it um, stopped being a colony. Um, and so it was under military dictatorship before that. But what people don't realize is that her father was the first military dictator of Burma when it when it became a country and so she was you know she's just continuing on the same things it's, it wasn't anything different about her and so the same atrocities continued wow. and um but yeah and um and it was just very dangerous you know like isis was very active in uh bangladesh at the time they were you know killing foreigners they were uh bombing hotels because there were foreigners staying in them. They killed, they blew up a hotel because there was one American staying there, killed like 70, 80 people, wow. maimed another 170. And, um, you know, we're blowing up cafes and restaurants that catered to foreigners or took them hostage and would execute anyone who couldn't recite the Quran in Arabic, things like that. Mm -hmm. So people were just not, didn't really know about it. And then when yeah. people did know about it, they were very reluctant to go yeah. because it was very dangerous. Okay. So that's why I felt I needed to go because there just wasn't enough yeah. people and support there. So I went there and then um, and then decided I wanted to sort of get back into practice and finish up neurosurgery. And so I was looking around where I should do that. You know, I should go, you know, back to Ireland and America. And then uh, I was always thinking about Australia. And I had friends that were down here who really enjoyed it. You know, they love the weather and I played rugby with them. And they're like, look, you'll love it. It's great. It's great lifestyle here. Great beaches, great weather. And, um, you know, and, and uh, yeah, so why don't you come down? So I just said, fine, check it out. Oh, it's the best. Um, I love it here. And so what do you do now? What is your practice? What is your... So I have, I have a couple of different ones. So I'm still, I'm still um, training for neurosurgery. So I'm not in a, um, it's weird how the training programs here work. So I work in neurosurgery, but it's I'm not in the official training program because I don't have permanent residency. So even though I've worked in neurosurgery the last four years, it hasn't counted towards anything, which is really yeah. annoying. If I knew that coming into it, I wouldn't have come. I would have just stayed in the U.S. Yeah. But, um, but I 
So I still work in neurosurgery as mm -hmm. a registrar. And then I have my own private practice in um, what's called functional medicine, mm -hmm. or could also be called like metabolic medicine or a preventative medicine. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's my my own practice. And um, and then I, I do neurosurgery as well. And then all the online stuff. Amazing, busy. So before we get to the carnivore, I actually wanted to ask you, what did you used to eat or how did you used to eat when you were playing rugby? And how did you feel? So for the 10 years I was playing professionally, five of those were carnivore and five were just normal omnivore. Okay, right? so you were already carnivore before and then you went off it and then you went back on. Yeah, so, but I wasn't, because I wasn't, wasn't doing carnivore. No one was talking about okay. doing a carnivore diet or an ancestrally appropriate diet. Okay. I just learned in college how toxic plants were and that's just how they defend themselves. Yeah. And they're very carcinogenic and even just the plants that we eat on a, on a daily basis. And so I had a cancer biology professor who was showing us this, is showing us all the plants that we were eating, just the normal fruits and vegetables that we would eat mm -hmm. and how toxic they were and how, how many carcinogens they had and yeah. how Brussels sprouts had 136 known carcinogens. Mushrooms had over 100, spinach, kale, broccoli, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, all the different fruits and vegetables that we would eat had... 60, 80, or over 100 known carcinogens. And they were quite abundant that um, we knew that there were um, roughly 10,000 times as many toxic components, like toxic chemicals that the plants made themselves naturally by weight than the pesticides we sprayed on them. Yeah. And that the natural toxins were hundreds of times more likely to cause cancer in the animal studies that had been done as compared to the pesticides. So... The argument there was that in the 1980s was, well, look, why are we, they, because they were trying to ban pesticides. So I said, well, why are we banning pesticides? The plants themselves are worse than the pesticides. And we all know fruits and vegetables are good for you. Therefore, the pesticides can't be bad for you. Mm -hmm. right? Well, that's assuming a fact that's not in evidence. You know, that's assuming that fruits and vegetables are good for you because we've been told that they're good for us. But are they really? You know, are these toxins actually good for us or safe anyway? Mm -hmm. Um they're not. And so oh. my professor was smarter than that. And he was saying that, like, look, these things are toxic. You're not supposed to eat them. We're not designed to eat them. And, um, you know, they don't want to be eaten. So he, he we were just blown away by all this. Mm -hmm. And I remember like looking around wildly, trying to see if there was like a TA or someone who was just like laughing in the corner, you know, trying not to laugh in the corner. Yeah. Um, to let, him, let us know he was joking, but there was no one. And so I just, I came to really, we all just sort of realized like, okay, this guy's serious. And I, um, I remember thinking in my head, I'm like, but, but, but vegetables are still good for you though. Right. Yeah. And he just looked at us and gave us a funny look. And he said, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. screw okay. plants. And, um, you know, I went to the store and I was just like, well, what the hell do I eat? Like everything that has plants in it or from plants or has plants as an ingredient. Yeah. And so I was just walking around and I just came around eggs and meat. And I was like, well, I guess that's, that's what I'll eat because it doesn't come from a plant. So that was my whole thing. So I wasn't doing a carnivore diet. Yeah. I wasn't doing an ancestral diet. I was just not eating plants. And so I defaulted into eggs and meat, mostly For meat. five years. Yeah. And I, I never felt better in my entire life until right now. And so why and did you go back into eating the plants then? Because I was in England playing professionally and I felt like a superhero. I could never get tired, never run out of energy. I was at just a different level of athleticism and performance than anyone I ever played with or against. And, um, and you know, I could play three, four games a weekend and just want to play more. Yeah. And I was playing for the university team. I was playing for the premiership team in Seattle. I was playing in as many games as I could on the weekends. I just, just wanted to play, 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 play. And you know, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't eating plants. It was just carnivore and just killing it. And so um, then I was in England and I felt I was feeling amazing going into England. I felt just like a superhero going into England. And then I was over there and I was trying to get meat. I was eating meat and beef and chicken and things like that. But um, some of the meat just didn't like cook right. I didn't have the same access to meat that I did in America. It's very easy. You know, food is very available in America. At least it was getting much more expensive now. And so I didn't have the same access. 
And I, for convenience, you know, I didn't have a car over there. So I had to like, you know, walk all these distances and just make it more convenient for me. I, I decided to get some chicken that had panko breadcrumbs on it. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, well, is this really bad? Should I have this? It has plant toxins, but, you know, dose makes the poison and, you know, maybe it's not that big a deal. That's the same thing people say now. Well, what the dose makes the poison. Okay. What's the dose? The dose is really small. And that's what people don't realize and they don't recognize. They just, they just have that as a throwaway line. Well, dose makes the poison. Fine. What's the dose? Yeah. They won't be able to answer that. They have no idea. So instead of saying, okay, well, let's find out the dose and then do this responsibly, they say, yeah, eat all the fruits and vegetables that you want, eat all the grains, everything, because yes, they have toxins, but dose makes the poison. And so you just, you're just ignoring that fact. You're just saying the dose makes the poison and therefore eat as much as you want because it's not a high enough dose. How do you know? How do you know that? Um, they don't. And so they're just being really foolish about it, but it's a small dose. And so a couple times a week, just having that panko breading on it was enough that I wasn't feeling good and I wasn't feeling as, as well. And I was getting sore and I was getting slowed down. I was getting more Yeah. tired. I didn't have the same energy. I didn't have the same, you know, athletic performance. I could still play really well and I would still play well enough, but I didn't, I, it wasn't like, like it was. I remember sitting on the couch one day, just sort of thinking about it and being confused and thinking to myself, why? Why don't I feel as superhuman amazing as I normally do? Am I not pushing myself? Am I not working as hard? Am I, I'm 25 now. Am I just over the hill? You used to say you get in your late twenties and that's it. You're just dying from there on. And I didn't know what it was. I just chalked it up to age, even though three months earlier, I felt like a superhero. Yeah. And now I don't. And I didn't know why, but that was sort of the crack in the door where it just sort of started opening up from there because that little bit of panko breading You know, I justified that. I rationalized that in my head. Is But it's not that probably big of a deal. the worst of the plants to have, like, you know, having bread, like with gluten in it. Yeah. And stuff. It's probably very different to having a piece of sweet potato or pumpkin, Well, you know. well, maybe. But the thing is, is that it it um, it was it was a small amount, but it was enough. And you know, a small bit of this stuff actually goes a long way. It's sort of an exponential drop. Yeah. when you start eating these plants and just, they just disrupt your body and your met metabolism and your metabolic structure. But, but the main thing that that did is it opened up the door to start eating a, a few other things and a few other things and a few other things. And then all of a sudden I was just like, well, you're supposed to eat plants. You're supposed to have this. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. They have, but there's like anti-cancer effects of these things. I was like, well, I don't have cancer. So why do I need to take something that that's basically chemotherapy? And, um, and also they have carcinogens. So they may have things that help you against cancer, but they have things that can cause cancer too. So, you know, do they balance and offset, but you just get, keep slammed with this stuff. And then, you know, because I had already started incorporating a few other things and it was like, okay, well, I'll throw in a salad every now and then and things like that. I was still mostly eating meat, but then Yeah. I would add in a salad or something like that. Every now and then I'd have some bread. I almost never ate junk food, almost never. Yeah. I mean, it'd be years in between times I go and get fast food or pizza or something like that, years. And so I was always cooking. It was always whole food and it was mostly meat, but just adding in that bit of plants and vegetables like that just made a complete difference. In five years, again, I never got, I never got tired. I never run out of energy. I didn't get sore after working out ever. You know, my back didn't hurt anymore. My back's always hurt since I was a teenager. Now it didn't. And then after in my later twenties, now it did, it did hurt again. And I was getting sore and achy and all this sort of stuff. Um, after working out. Um, and uh, when I was in or out of the season, when I was on carnivore, I was always in shape. I was always lean and muscular. I never lost my musculature. I never put it on fat ever. Um, and um, when I was just eating salads and meat and you know maybe some carbs sometimes, not all that much, I wasn't doing keto, but I just never really ate all that sort of stuff. I never bought bread. You know, Yeah. maybe I'd make some whole wheat pasta every now and then. That's it. And, um, but then I was, if I wasn't in training, I was gaining fat and losing muscle always, Mm -hmm. you know? So if I didn't like work out for two weeks, I could see myself start to get a little more chubbier and a little less muscular, muscular, right? It was, it was very quick. You know, it was in weeks, things would start doughing up and I'd have to work for weeks and months to get back down to like a lean, hard physique. 
um, you know, I take, we take a month off around Christmas uh, for rugby and, you know, I'd be lifting weights, but I wouldn't be doing all the running and the sprinting. And I would, I would, I wouldn't get fat, but I would put on a lot of weight and I'd be more chubby. And it would take a month or six weeks until I felt like I was back in shape again. Um, that never happened when I was on carnivore ever. You know, Yeah. I never got out of shape. It didn't matter. And so like now, even though I don't get a chance to work out as much, I'm, I'm never out of shape. I never get out of shape. I'm always lean. I'm always muscular. Um, I'm back in the gym now for about a month. But before that, I hadn't been going regularly, maybe once every month, once every couple of months, um, I do a workout uh, for 18 months. You Yeah. know, now I'm back in regularly, but I, I never stopped looking like I was in shape. Everyone Yeah. always say, like, how do you find the time to work out so much? I don't. Like, so, I, you know, I, I'm not working out, but I'm always lean. I'm always muscular. Always. I never I can get in better shape, Yeah. but I never get out of shape. And so that's a massive difference as well. So what is your stance on things like sulforaphane when um, there is evidence that it helps to upregulate um, the anti-inflammatory genes and downregulate down the uh, inflammatory genes and helps to prevent cancer and, yeah, those things? But does it though? Well, You know, what I mean, is what, 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 well, that's what they say, but I mean, what's the evidence for that? You know, and at what dose? Because again, dose makes the poison. And so Yeah. if we're talking about this thing, having physiological effects in our body at a certain point, at a certain dose, you're going to have negative deleterious physical effect, um, physiological effects. You know, there's something called like this hormetic effect. I mean, first of all, Yeah. sulforaphane is a toxin. Yeah. It is, it is a designed to be toxic to animals eating it. Yeah. It is so toxic that the plant cannot keep it in its natural form. It has to keep it in two separate molecules, but then when it's crushed and macerated, like an animal's chewing it, it releases this and it combines into sulforaphane. So it's like a kill switch. Say, so if you're going to kill me, I'm going to kill you too. And that's what it is. And, then, and a lot of plants do that with cyanide as well, hydrogen cyanide, which is toxic to all life. And you start chewing it up and you release these chemicals and it turns into hydrogen cyanide. So it's the same thing. With sulforaphane, the plant is not trying to help you. It's certainly not trying to help you stop cancer. First of all, animals in nature don't get cancer, right? Cancer is a disease of civilization. It's a disease of modernity. It's a disease Yeah. of eating the wrong thing and having your body not work the way it's supposed to. So first of all, you don't need it to prevent cancer. Just not eating the wrong thing prevents cancer. Sulforaphane, again, is a toxin. And so you could say, you could... pretend that it's hormetic at a certain level but unless you have calculated that level perfectly then you have no idea right so you say okay at this dose this is helpful past that dose is not helpful and if you, if you want to say that you have to show that but you also then have to draw that line so we have this this it's called the therapeutic window in medicine Yeah. so there are medications that we get from plants a lot of them aspirin we Yeah. get from willow bark Uh, digitalis we get from uh, foxglove right Yeah. but we measure foxglove in micrograms millionths of a gram and if you get 50 micrograms too much it can stop your heart and kill you because that's what the the foxglove is trying to do it's trying to kill animals and Yeah. stop their heart if they eat it Yeah. right and that's what sulforaphane is as well it's something designed to harm an animal that's eating that plant um we're not in the garden of eden These plants don't want us to eat them. They're not there for us to help us. They're there for themselves to perpetuate their own species and survival. And so those toxins, while they may be able to be used medicinally, are not going to be helpful in all circumstances at all doses. So you have to understand where that, that therapeutic window is for digitalis, or else you're not going to get enough and it's not going to help you with your issue, or it's going to be too much and it can kill you. So that's going to be the same with sulforaphane. If indeed it's ever beneficial at any dose, which I'm not even that convinced of, but if But it you were, do believe it would be in under herbal specific, medicine. sorry. You do believe in herbal medicine. Yeah. Well, we've been using it for thousands of years, Yeah. but that's the thing. You can use things medicinally, but that's the thing. It's medicinally. What is a medicine? It's a poison Yeah. that is more, is beneficial in certain circumstances. It does more good than harm Yeah. in certain circumstances. So like, Digitalis, if you have heart failure, this increases the contractility of your heart, so it beats stronger. Okay, so that's helpful. A little too much, it stops and you die, Yeah. right? So you need to know what that exact dose is.
and you need to have the right situation. So you and I taking digitalis, not a good idea. Mm. We don't have the condition for which digitalis is beneficial. Yeah. And so it wouldn't be, it would only be hormetic for people with heart failure. Right. And, um, you know, if, and maybe other conditions that digitalis helps where I only know of it for heart failure. So that would be the same with sulforaphane. So saying that you just, just take sulforaphane and it's good for everyone at any dose. I mean, that, that's just a, that's just a brazen statement that, that is not, uh, borne out by the evidence. Yeah. And again, what is the dose? What's the dosage to treat? What's the dosage to the dosage to do harm? Where's that line and who benefits? Is it everybody? Just everybody? Well, it prevents cancer in everybody. Cancer is pretty damn complex. And there's different cancers that form in different ways. So, I mean, why are we saying that it's going to, it's going to prevent all cancers? Um, also, does it help? And, you know, this is something with anti-VEGF. You know, they say there's the anti-VEGF in mushrooms and we use anti-VEGF to cut off the blood supply of cancers or allow, or stop them from making new blood supplies so for cancers to grow and say, oh, look, this has great anti-cancer effects. Great. Do you have cancer? Then why are you taking chemotherapy? Chemotherapy yeah. is beneficial when you have cancer, but it still kills people. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, this is something you wouldn't just take on just on the weekend just for fun. Oh, well, chemotherapy is good for cancer. And so <laughs> I'll just take chemotherapy for the rest of my life. Exactly. Not a good idea. And that's the argument that we're using with sulforaphane yeah. and with, um, uh, you know, anti-VEGF and things like that. Yeah. You know, this is not, and, 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 you know, to the point you made earlier, you know, well, this increases, um, anti-inflammatory sort of effects in your body. But why does it do that? Because your body is trying to detoxify a toxin in your body. Yeah. Anytime you introduce toxins into your body, anytime there's a, a bacteria that goes in your body, your immune system rises up yeah. and you turn on different processes and genes in your body to fight that inflammation, to fight that, yeah. that uh, toxin. So but that's what your body is doing. They say that like the little exposure to the toxins and to the stress makes you more resilient. Do you agree with that or not? Based on, no, I don't, I don't agree with that. I'm just asking you're, because you're, that's what Dave because, no, but, and all those experts say. So I'm just picking your brains on what do you think? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Not even a little bit. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, the thing is, is that, is that, you know, we're seeing a, re a response to a toxin. Yeah. And so you expose yourself to a toxin and your body starts responding to that toxin. And we're saying, hey, that's good. Well, why yeah. is it good? I mean, is it, I mean, that's like saying that you, you drink alcohol and our body's responding to that and yeah. bring up all these defenses against alcohol and they, breaking down alcohol. Well, that's good. We like all these things that it's doing, but yeah. the alcohol is causing damage while it's in there. That's yeah. why your body's trying to detoxify it. So it, are you getting more good than harm? And yeah. what proof do you have? A lot of the times they just say, Hey, look, it upregulates these genes that, that, in, that improve our, you know, immune system. Yeah or improve uh, antioxidant sort of effects. Okay, but do those overwhelm the, you know, the the damage being caused yeah. by the stimulus? Yeah. And is is it doing more good than harm? Yeah, well, it makes sense so. you comparing to alcohol, that makes completely sense. So the next thing, what's the argument on fiber? Because lots of gut health doctors recommend mm -hmm. fiber for um, gut microbiome diversity mainly. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you think? Like, do, can you have a diverse microbiome just eating red meat? Uh, can you have healthy gut just eating red meat? And what's the evidence? Yeah, well, they, they've done studies on Inuits that um, don't eat any fiber at all, and they have the most diverse and healthy gut microbiomes ever studied. Right. So, and then there's there's more and more and more examples of people on uh, carnivore diets now checking their microbiome. And mm -hmm. having extremely healthy, extremely diverse microbiomes. A friend of mine, Dr. Sean O'Mara, um, who's been doing carnivore for you know five plus years now, and he came to it. Uh, every, a lot of people are coming to carnivore from very different directions. He came to it because he did. He does a lot of uh, research for the National Institutes of Science, and he did one on um, uh, uh, visceral fat, so the fat inside the abdomen around the organs, and he found that there's a direct relationship between that and metabolic dysfunction. And yeah. that is actually metabolically active and can cause all sorts of problems, increase your, your risk of getting cancer. It actually sequesters in um, natural killer T cells, which are your, your body's first uh, cell, line of cellular defense. 
against cancer and precancerous cells. And so if you have more visceral fat, it locks in those NKT cells and doesn't allow them out. So you get higher rates of cancer and, and worse outcomes, so higher mortality rates. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he found a, lo a lot of other sort of connections with visceral fat as well and how, how harmful this was. And he found that the best diet to be on to remove visceral fat down to nothing was a carnivore diet yeah. and that exercise like sprinting and uh, weightlifting were the best exercises to do that. Yeah. Um, and there's other things that go into it too, stress, sleep, all these sorts of things. But those are the main, those are the things for the diet. And so he came from another, another angle. So that's how he's eaten specifically to keep his visceral fat down. And he sent off his microbiome or a stool sample to a, um, one of the, one of the companies in America and the, I think it was like the president or the CEO or someone, someone in charge at the company personally called him and said, you have the healthiest microbiome we've ever studied in the history of our company. How yeah. the hell did you do that? What are you doing that's, yeah. that's making your, my, your microbiome that good? You know, and, and so they, they talked about it, but um, there are already studies in the literature showing that the Inuit have extraordinarily diverse and healthy microbiomes. Can you send me some um, so the studies idea, I'd be interested to read? I haven't, yeah. Yeah, can. I'll try and track them down for you, yeah. but yeah. But so, so why do you think everyone tells us to eat fiber then? Mark, what's the... Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot of different reasons. But, um, you know, in the 1980s is when this really started getting pushed uh, really hard because, you know, you people were getting constipated and they were getting fat. And um, and they were saying, well, if you eat a lot of fiber, it has no nutrient nutritional content. And so, but it just has bulk. And so it fills up your stomach, makes you think you're full. And so you feel satisfied but you're not actually eating anything. There was like a celery diet where it actually it took more calories to process and digest the celery than you actually got out of the celery. So they said, oh, this, this is great. You just eat all the celery you want. And you'll just lose all this weight because you're not actually bringing any, any nutrition in. So the argument was you should eat vegetables because they didn't have nutrition and you'd lose weight because of that. That was the argument in the, in the 80s. Before yeah. that, um, what, what got this on the map was a guy named Dr. Burkett. Burkett's lymphoma is named after. He's a very famous um, and and um, well regarded surgeon, and he was in Africa, you know, doing some sort of work there. And he noticed that um, that the natives there they were eating different plants or whatever, and they had very large bowel motions. And they said this must be because they eat a lot of plants and a lot of fiber. And he noticed that they had lower rates of of colon cancer. And so he just said, must be the fiber. That was it. There's no intervention. There's no study. There were no trials. It was just his guess. And yeah. because he was a famous guy, his guess got repeated and repeated and repeated. And now it's just what everyone thinks. If you eat fiber, this reduces your risk of colon cancer. Okay. That's never actually been shown. Um, as to do with the microbiome, yeah, you know, you have microbes in your in your gut that that eat fiber and can produce short chain fatty acids. That that's how we used to survive. That's how herbivores that that eat fiber get their energy. They don't eat, they don't get energy from fiber. Their mi microbes get energy from fiber. They eat the fiber and they produce saturated fat and they die off. And then the animal absorbs that as protein. So they eat fiber, but what they get is fat and protein. So we have like some of those microbes, you can breed for them and they'll make some of those saturated fats, but we get hardly anything from that. And people will say, well, that's what your enterocytes really like. Okay. Well, you get those from uh, just eating meat and eating animal fat because those short chain fatty acids, um, you know, butyric acid, butyrate, these sorts of things are your main ketone bodies that you make if you're just in ketosis and so you feed that from the inside out anyway and that's the primary energy source of your heart and your brain as well or three quarters of your or two thirds of your brain anyway um so you know this is this is assuming a fact that's not an evidence they're saying you need fiber in order to have the proper microbiome well no, that's not true you know and you don't need any fiber and they have great microbiomes we were we were evolved away from eating fiber we have an appendix the size of your pinky finger Millions of years ago, that was four feet long, and that was a cecum, and that's where fiber would pack in and and get fermented and break down into fatty acids, short chain fatty acids, saturated fat, and protein, and that's what we would absorb. That's what gorillas and chimpanzees who eat fibrous plants. That's what they do. They have a, an elongated cecum, and that's and that's how they they get fat and protein from yeah. the plants that they eat. And we've lost that. We haven't done that in millions of years, right? Because we haven't needed to, wanted to. Uh, for millions of years. So we haven't been eating fiber for millions of years. So 
what we've been eating for millions of years is going to be a biologically appropriate for us. And the microbiome that we have, the oral biome, the gut biome that we have is going to be appropriate to our species. If you're eating your appropriate diet, you should have your species appropriate microbiome. You have your oral biome, you know, yeah. the, the bacteria that eat away your enamel uh, feed on uh, carbohydrates, like fibers and sugars, right? So you eat, you know, carbohydrates like fiber, like sugar, you're going to breed the, uh, the oral microbes that are going to rot your teeth. This is why you have to sterilize your mouth. Why would your mouth need to be sterilized? What animal in nature's mouth is sterile? It's never sterile. It always has bacteria, but they have the right bacteria because they're eating the right things. And so animals' teeth <clears throat> in nature don't rot out unless they're damaged or they, they've eaten something wrong or something like that. But yeah. they, if they're eating their normal diet, they don't. And you're not going to get an inappropriate microbiome either. There are microbes that are associated that like carbohydrates, that like uh, fiber, that are associated with uh, different diseases such as uh, multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. And, uh, you know, SIBO, this is generally uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. This is generally regarded as feeding on carbohydrates as well. Yeah. Um, then you have to look at the studies that have come up on, on fiber. And I've looked at a number of these meta-analyses. They say, well, this improves blood pressure. This improves yeah. blood sugar. How does fiber work? It's not a nutrient because we can't break it down. We don't get any nutrition from it that we absorb, right? Yeah. So it's just going through your, your, your tubes. Well, it's a physical structure. It can cause a, a physical barrier and lattice between your enzymes and the food you're eating uh, to break it down. And then a barrier between that broken down food and the lumen of your intestine to absorb it. So some estimate that you can uh, block the absorption of up to 30% of the food that you eat if, yeah. you eat if you eat it with a lot of fiber. If you're eating a lot of garbage that's not good for you, a lot of sugars, yeah. a lot of carbs, a lot of starches, a lot of different toxins or whatever, blocking out 30% of that, probably a good idea. And this is probably why, you know, if it lowers blood sugar, how does it lower blood sugar? It's not getting in your body. It's not doing anything to your metabolism because it's, it's outside of your body. The yeah. lumen of your intestine is outside of your body, yeah. right? So it has to do something there. So it's blocking the absorption. And then we have diabetic medications like this, like Acrobos, that just blocks the absorption. Metformin uh, somewhat blocks yeah. the absorption of nutrients as well. And that's just, you're just not bringing in as much carbohydrates. And so your blood sugar is lower. Yeah. That's how that works. That's how fiber works. Yeah. And so if you're not eating things that aren't good for you, yeah. well, you, you don't want to block the absorption. Mm -hmm. That's deleterious. You're going to get malabsorption. And so you don't want that. And then you look at the studies that say, you know, meta-analysis saying, that, oh, this lowers blood pressure. Okay, look at the studies. Look at the studies that say this. Um, first of all, they're looking at, there's two kinds of studies that they'll do fiber with. One, they'll have standard processed food garbage diet versus people who eat more fruits and vegetables. And they're yeah. saying, well, that has fiber and this doesn't. That's the only difference. Therefore, fiber is good. It's yeah. not the only difference. There's a lot of other differences. But uh, either way, that's, you know, that's what they're saying. They're comparing it to a processed food diet. And a lot of times it's like questionnaires. They're like, they, they give you a flyer, like the nurses study that um, like once a year, they get, they get sent a questionnaire and they say, list out every meal that you've had in the last 365 days. How yeah. the hell are people going to do that? So it's yeah. a blind guess. It's yeah. not accurate. It's not science. Right. Yeah. And so... And you say, well, well, the people that eat more fruits and vegetables versus more processed food that, or meat that doesn't have fiber, that gets better. But they lump in pizza and fast food and lasagna and bread, well, you know, like sandwiches with uh, meat. They just say, well, there could be meat in there. Therefore, that's all meat. And they say, well, people who eat less meat, which is really less processed food, um, have better outcomes in certain respect. They say, oh, must be the fiber. Fiber is good. Fiber is better. Plants are good. Plants are better. It's nonsense. Then the other ones are... There's some interventional trials, generally small, but they'll give people fiber pills, which is better, right? You're just you're just testing the fiber, yeah. And then say, but it's on standard diets. They're on they're on standard nonsense processed food garbage diets, and then you give them a fiber pill, and there's this slight improvement. Like, okay, well, like I said, if you block out the absorption of this garbage, you're you're getting less garbage in your body. I I don't I don't have a problem with that. But if you're not eating garbage, then you don't want to block it out. It's pretty yeah. simple. But when you look at things like for blood pressure, 
the studies that looked at that and there's meta analyses and oh look at this meta analysis and and people really get get uh, really impressed by the word meta analysis but if you have garbage studies going into the meta analysis you get garbage results in your meta analysis you know, garbage in garbage out there's a yeah. saying for that and so you look at these things and it's garbage in garbage out you look at these studies i i remember someone um was going off about this and so I was talking to him about it. He said, oh, look at this meta-analysis. So I looked at the meta-analysis and had like 30 different studies in that regard. They give somebody a, a pill or whatever. And I just randomly took like five of them and, and and looked at all of those. They were adding a pill. It was always a processed food diet. They just added a fiber pill to it. And then they checked their blood pressure and it dropped down on average like 1.5 points. Right? So your blood pressure is going from 170 to 168.5. Yeah. Oh my God, look at the marbles of fiber. It lowers blood pressure. Now you can say that, yeah, you know, but you have to work on keeping a straight face because it, I mean, it's useless. It, it technically did lower your, your blood pressure, but not to any meaningful degree. Yeah. And so, you know, that's the thing. And there's, there are other studies that show that actual interventional trials that have shown that people with, with, irritable bowel and um, symptomatic constipation. Mm -hmm. They took them out, they stratified them and they said, okay, we're going to have a group, just keep eating what you're eating, same amount of fiber. Another group, we're going to increase the amount of fiber. One, we're going to reduce the fiber and one, we're going to eliminate the fiber. And it stratified out an exact opposite of what people would think. People that stayed the same, stayed the same, nothing new there. People who increased their fiber actually got worse. People who removed fiber, reduced fiber, got better. Yeah. Or improved their symptoms anyway. Yeah. And people who eliminated fiber eliminated their symptoms. Yeah. Right. So exactly the opposite of what we've been told. There's another study. Um, I actually sent you that clip from uh, Zoe Harkham and she discusses it where they looked at over 2000 people and they, and they stratified it out to, to a low fiber, high fiber group. And the high fiber group died of cardiovascular disease more often than the low fiber group. Yeah. 2000 people. So, you know, these studies aren't perfect. None of them are, but you know, the, the point is that, that the, the, the arguments and evidence for fiber is not as strong as people make it out to be. Yeah. And no animal in nature eats fibrous plants and as, as a mainstay of their diet, unless they have some capacity to break down and utilize fiber, even frugivores, they're getting most of their um, nutrition from the, from the fibrous parts of the plant, not necessarily yeah. the sugars and, um, you know, and certainly major herbivores such as cows, giraffes, um, gorillas, etc. They have a capacity to ferment and break down the fiber into saturated fat and protein. We do not, we've lost that ability because yeah. our species has not eaten fiber for millions of years up until last few thousand years when we just all of a sudden started ramming it home. And then in the last 40 years, when we started saying this is so important and yet we're getting fatter and sicker than we've ever been in human history. Right? So why are we saying that this is all making us better when we can clearly see it's making us worse? Yeah. And so the question, so you say that, um, and I can see that in a carnivore mm -hmm. diet, you lean, you're muscular, you look fit and all that, but is that suitable for women in reproductive age when they do need some fat maybe to for their hormones and things like that? What do you think? Well, you're getting 80% of your calories from fat. You're getting two grams of fat for every one gram of protein generally. And one to two grams of fat to one gram of protein. You're getting far more fat and the precursor to your hormones, which is cholesterol. Your body makes all of these hormones out of cholesterol. And so in fact, it's the best thing that you can do because you're getting more of it. You're getting more fat. You're getting more cholesterol. Um, you make most of the cholesterol that your body needs. Um, yeah. You only absorb cholesterol if your body has a need for it. But when you're eating plants and you're eating plant oils in particular, they have cholesterol too. Plants have cholesterol. They're called plant sterols. And those are close enough to our own cholesterol that our liver stops making cholesterol because it thinks yeah. we have enough. And so then you don't have, but they, they can't get turned into to hormones. They can't get turned into estrogen or progesterone yeah. or cortisol or testosterone yeah. or pregnenolone or androstene or any of these other things, yeah. right? Or vitamin D, right? Or your brain, right? So, you know, they, they mimic it and then they actually suppress your body's ability to make it 
And now you don't have enough cholesterol available for your normal workings, for your hormones, for your vitamin D, which is a hormone. Uh, yeah. Vitamin D in women um, during puberty actually gives them that sort of that, that the, the shoulders that narrow to the waist and then sh uh, stretch yeah. out around the hips. So that sort of hourglass figure. And in men, it sort of broadens the shoulders and narrows the hips, gives that sort yeah. of V shape. That's vitamin D. Vitamin yeah. D does that during, um, during puberty. So, you know, this is a hormone that's very important and you don't get enough of it when you're eating plants because you're, you're stopping your body from making it. Um, think about it this way. What animal on earth eats a different diet, male and female, right? Mm -hmm. What female, what female animals eat different yeah. diets when they're pregnant or in estrus or yeah. just barren? Yeah. You just eat what your species eats. That's yeah. what's that's what happens. Mammals drink their mother's milk and then they're weaned onto their mother's diet and they eat yeah. that for the rest of their life and they wean their children onto it too. So female lions, when they're just hanging out, they eat meat. Yeah. When they're in estrus, they eat meat. Yeah. When they're pregnant, they eat meat. When they're breastfeeding, they eat meat. Yeah. When they stop that, they eat meat. You just yeah. eat meat. So if you're eating what your body's designed to eat, your body's going to do what it needs to do. You may need more. You may yeah. need more meat, more fat, more of those nutrients because you have a high, higher metabolic demand because you're you're trying to grow a new life and you're trying to breastfeed and produce more milk. You're going to need more. Yeah. But you're not going to need anything different. You yeah, just so, need what you're yeah, designed so, to eat. Let's say for women in reproductive age and pregnant, would you recommend for them to eat more fish like fatty fish eggs organ meat to get more nutrients or no oh, I mean, you I sure don't, you can. I don't know yeah. you said you don't eat organ meats do you oh very rarely yeah. the thing is, is that is that you can get most of what you need or every well, really most people can get everything that you need just from eating muscle meat and fat the inuit um in, at least in certain areas yeah. just ate the, the muscle meat and fat. They didn't eat organs. They yeah. would feed the organs to their dogs. Um, and, you know, we're, we're organ organ organ. sorry. <laughs> I love organ meats. I'm going yeah. to, I was telling well, you. Look, it's not, it's, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. You know, that's the thing is, is that you just, you just want to think about it in proportion of the animal. Like yeah. if we're, if we're, because that's the whole idea, right? We're animals. We're supposed to be, we have a, a, a biologically appropriate diet, yeah. just like all animals. And so we need to figure out what that is. And that's, what's going to be most, most important for us. Um, you know, that's how you study nutrition. You study biology. That's what you do. And what is biologically appropriate for humans? That's yeah. what we're supposed to eat. What have we been eating for millions of years? That's what you're supposed to eat. Yeah. So organs, um, you know, they, they come in limited form. So yeah. if you take down a giraffe, you yeah. know, that's going to be enough meat on there for you to eat as an individual for the next three years, right? Yeah. Giraffes are big animals. It's got one liver. It's got one heart. It's got two kidneys. Right. Yeah. The majority of the meat on there is the skeletal muscle meat and fat. Right. Yeah. So you just want to think about that. Like, yes, the organs are very nutrient dense, but if you're eating mostly organs or too much organs, then you can actually get overloaded. You can actually get a uh, vitamin overload. Yeah. Um, polar bear liver, for example, has so much vitamin A in it that it'll kill you. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, you just need to be aware of that. It's, probably difficult to, to sort of get that, especially in our nutrient deprived state. If you're eating process or a normal standard American diet, standard Australian diet, plant food diet, um, and all those diets are plant food, by the way, the standard American diet is still 75, 80% of calories from plants. Yeah. There's not, these aren't meat heavy diets. Yeah. Um, they're actually plant heavy diets. It's just mostly processed plants. Um, and so if you're eating one of those, it's very nutritionally deficient yeah, organs are your best friend. You know, they're, they're so nutritious, so nutrient dense. Yeah. Um, if you're just eating meat, you generally get everything you need from meat. Now yeah. we're not eating wild animals anymore. We're not yeah. eating, you know, wild buffalo and, and mammoths yeah. and things like that. They're not eating what they're supposed to eat. So they're not as healthy as they're supposed to be. Um, regeneratively raised grass fed and finished cows, for instance, at least from some ranchers that I've spoken to that do this, they find that their micronutrient content in their animals is uh, four or five times higher than um, than normal traditionally or factory uh, raised sort of things that, that have a feedlot feedlot yeah. fed raised or factory farm chickens are being fed a bunch of corn and soy and feed. Yeah. Okay. They have far less micronutrients than pasture raised eggs. So um, I think it's Joel Solidin. Um, a regenerative farmer, large scale regenerative farmer in America, and his eggs 
uh, had far more folate, for instance. So like a normal egg in America had 41 milligrams of folate, which is fine. Yeah. But his eggs had over a thousand milligrams of folate. So very different. Of right? course, I so wouldn't recommend to anyone to eat factory farmed yeah. products. That's terrible. Even yeah. just because the animals have had grains. So all the stuff from grains yeah. stuck in them, right? Well, they have a they have a capacity to to break these things down. That's the whole idea of eating animals instead of eating plants. Plants have toxins, and um, you know what's what's that guy? Dan Butner, that pathological liar. Um, he he came up with the the blue zone sort of things and lied profusely yeah. in that misrepresented all these different people that actually ate a lot more meat yeah. than most people around them ate. Um, and also it was pension for all. There's a lot of people that lied about their age to get pensions. And so yeah. they're saying, Oh yeah, my dad's 108. And actually it turns out he's 78. They just lied about his, you know, his age years ago so that he could get qualify for a pension early. Yeah. And, um, or people are, that are dead and they're saying, no, 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 they're still alive for the last 20 years when actually they passed away so they could yeah. keep collecting their pension checks. Um, but anyway, he's a pathological liar. And he um, and he sold the, the blue zones to the Seventh Day Adventist Church, who are religiously anti meat, and so they've been on a crusade for the last hundred, thirty, hundred forty years against meat, you know. And they founded Kellogg's Cereal Sanitarium Foods here in Australia, make wheat bix. They get tax. They don't pay taxes on that, by the way. That the church has tax free status on that, yeah. and um, and they are the major funders of the Australian Dietetic Association. They founded the American Nutritional Dietetics Association. They wrote the first textbook taught in universities on nutrition and dietetics in 1925. Lena Cooper. It's all about plant based. Yeah. So you know, um, people on the McGovern report vilifying uh, cholesterol was written. The McGovern report was written by a Seventh Day Adventist, Dr. Pritikin who pushed a plant-based diet, low fat, low meat diet, was uh, a professor at the Loma Linda Medical Center, which is the medical school for the Seventh-day Adventists. And he was, a ad, um, I don't know if he was an Adventist himself, but he certainly said that he read all of their works and was really impressed by it, the whole plant-based yeah. idea. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, you, just, you can't trust any of this sort of stuff. Yeah. But, um, you know, sorry, you were going to say something? No, 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 I'm just listening. I'm just running out of time. I've got a few more right. questions. It's still fascinating sure. to talk to you for hours. I just quickly want to ask before it's going to end, what do you eat in a day? I heard that you talk that you only eat once a day and you only eat beef, nothing else? Mostly, yeah. The vast majority of what I would eat would, would be beef. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just feel best on that. It's going to be most nutrient dense. Um, oh, sorry. And just to finish your, your, your last question, um, you know, when you're eating grains and things like that, um, yeah. It's, uh, you know, these animals have a capacity to, to break out the, the toxins. So if an animal is designed to eat that plant, it's able to break down and detoxify those things and eliminate those toxins. Dan Butner said that, oh, you don't want to eat meat because it actually, for every one pound of meat that you eat, you get equivalent of 11 pounds of plant toxins in that meat. So first of all, he's admitting that there are plant toxins yeah, and these aren't good for you. And he's saying, don't eat meat because you get actually more concentrated plant toxins. Flat out lie. That yeah. is one hundred percent false, and he's he's an absolute liar, and I, I'll say that to his face. Um, but what about no the herbicide and pesticide on the grains? If like uh, because I don't, I only eat grass fed animals, grass fed grass. That's good because yeah. I think that I agree with the plant toxins that they can process it. But what about the herbicide and pesticides that the grains mm. are sprayed with? They that get stuck in the animal, doesn't it? In the fat, yeah. So that's the thing. First of all, there's 10,000 times more toxins, just natural toxins, than the herbicides and pesticides yeah. that are sprayed on it, right? Yeah. So the plant is worse. Um, but ruminant animals are better able to detoxify even things that they're not designed to eat. So definitely when you're looking at chickens, pig, fish, when you're getting those things factory farm, those are those are not great. They're yeah. really not great um, because they're being fed this crap. They have, they have a simple digestive tract. They're like us. They're monogastric. And so they they aren't really able to detoxify things that they're not designed to eat very well. Yeah. And so that can sort of get into their tissue. It's not good. Cows are better at that. Goats are better at that because they have this, this rumen. And yeah. so um, they can better detoxify this stuff and mm -hmm. not have that get into the meat. It's not going to be necessarily as nutritious. Yeah. But it, it shouldn't be toxic like it would if you fed corn corn and soy to a pig more of that crap is going to get through to the the meat and the fat of the pig yeah. less of that's going to get through with a cow 
but I agree with you. It's better to do grass fed and finished. Not everybody has access to that, yeah. but a grain fed and finished cow is still better than everything else on earth. Okay. Right. Because it's not as good, but it's better than everything else. Yeah. Um, and so, and it has more nutritional content as yeah. well, but I even saw um, a report last year, a few months ago that suggested that ruminant animals like cows could actually detoxify and eliminate glyphosate from the things that they're eating. So, you know, these things are very, very complex, um, you know, four barrel chambers in their, in their foregut that are very complex and can break down a lot of stuff. So if you're going to eat meat, you know, obviously you want to go for the highest quality meat that you can afford and have access to, but this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be limited to, you know, the elite and the people that can afford it, this should be available to everybody. Any meat is going to be better than every plant because all meat is good for you and every plant causes harm to varying degrees. Some will just kill you, most will kill you. Yeah. There are 390,000 plants in the world, most will kill you. Most will kill every animal. Most plants will kill most animals, right? And so that's because these are toxic and they're designed to be so. So all meat, is going to be good for you. It's just not going to be as good as some of the other meats. But yeah. if you can only afford grain finished beef, you're still going to be hundred times better, a thousand times better and healthier just eating that grain finished beef than you would if you were eating, including plants and things like that. Most of what I eat is grain finished beef. I, I just don't have real access to grass finished. I, when I was in America, I bought a whole cow. It was just grass fed and finished its whole life. And it was amazing and I loved it. Yeah. And I've never felt better in my entire life. I don't have the same access here. You told and... Brent to send you a cow. <laughs> Sorry? You told Dr. Brent to send you a cow. Yeah, well, that I do. I need to do that. Now. He, he won't <laughs> eat his own cow, so maybe he'll let me eat him. And, um, and so um, so that's the thing. So, you know, it's it's um, I feel fantastic, you know, yeah. and I, I yes, I would feel better on grass finish, but I feel better. I feel a thousand times better than I've ever felt in my entire life right. on grain right. finish. So the, the ruminant animals are really good. Yeah. Um, they're, they're better able to do that. You want to throw in a bit of organs. I've checked my bloods. I, I, I have optimal levels yeah. for my hormones and my, my yeah. nutrients and things like that. So I don't right. necessarily need it. Some people do, and it's I don't think it's a problem. I just think yeah. that people should keep the organs in balance with the, with the rest of the animal. Remember there's, yeah. there's one liver per cow that cow is going to feed you for the year. So, you know, a small amount of liver every now and then is fine. Yeah. You know? But if you start having 300 grams yeah. of your 600 grams for the day, if your half of your weight is going to be liver, yeah. that's too much. Like you don't need that. And I think that you could, you could run into uh, problems with uh, um, getting a sort of a toxic load of, of some of these nutrients. And so for, to sum it up for people who have no idea about carnivores, so as a carnivore, you can eat any meat, any organ meat, any fish. Can you eat eggs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. You can eat eggs. What about dairy products? No. Dairy is a bit of a gray area. So the, the meat is the meal. You know, that's where you're going to get all your nutrients from. Yeah. Um, you know, things like like raw milk is has it's very nutritious. So it also has a lot of carbohydrates that you yeah. don't want. Uh, that's going to raise your insulin. That's going to disrupt yeah. your metabolism. And um, that's a whole other rabbit hole yeah. to go down insulin is a very important hormone in your body yeah. it has it affects hundreds of has a, over a hundred different um uses and 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 effects in your body only one of them brings down your blood sugar and so if your blood sugar goes up and your insulin comes up to get that down yes it's going up to bring blood sugar down but it's also being up to affect all yeah. the other hundred things that it does so that's that's going to be um deleterious you don't want that okay. and so um yeah and so the the dairy has good nutrients in it, but it's not the meal. It's not the the best that you can do. So I'd use it as a condiment. Mm -hmm. You have some cheese with an omelet, cheese on some meat. So you allowed it as a carnivore, like ferment, like let's say kefir and things like that. Kefir is um generally pretty high in carbs. Yeah. You know, if you made it yourself and you made and you made sure it, it um well, like a proper kefir. Yeah, because it's Sorry. fermented. Proper kefir is actually not very high in carbs if it's not no has got no additives. Yeah. If you watch if you I've yet to find a kefir here in Australia that hasn't had like I six found one. Of carbs. For, I send it to yeah. you. Okay. One, so, one so that's the thing. So it is if you're doing something like the fermented yeah. stuff that, that gets rid yeah. of the carbs, that's fine. It's yeah. just um 
you may not. You know, I mean, even your yogurts have different amounts of carbohydrates. So if you find like a yogurt that um, doesn't have any carbs in it, you know, having that as a condiment is fine. Having a bit of kefir yeah. as a condiment is fine. You know, it has like you know, good healthy bacteria in there. And mm -hmm. if you eat that with your meat, you can get some of that bacteria down. Yeah. Uh, most people are pretty poor on lactobacillus, which is what you get with the the, the dairy. Yeah. Um, but I would just use it as a as a condiment. I certainly wouldn't have any carbohydrates with it. I think yeah. that's detrimental. I don't think you want that. Um, so if you're having a bit of dairy, a bit of cheese, butter, most people do fine with butter yeah. and a bit of um, fermented dairy without yeah. any carbs, yeah. no, that's fine, but still use it as a condiment. Yeah. Um, most people do fine with butter, but there are people that are a bit more sensitive to dairy. The casein can be a bit pro-inflammatory, yeah. especially people with autoimmune diseases. They should they should avoid dairy yeah. because that can trigger their autoimmunity. Plants really trigger autoimmunity, yeah. but dairy can as well. Yeah. And so they need to avoid that. Um, and then some people just uh, stall their weight loss. You know, yeah. people are trying to lose weight. A lot of people come to carnivore because they're trying to lose weight. Dairy is a major weight loss stall. Yeah. Um, it can be a bit addictive. There are there are mild opiates in yeah. uh, dairy. And yeah. so you, know, you can just be like, Ooh, I want more of that. And so you can sort of eat yeah. more than your body actually yeah. wants. And uh, and then you still eat the same amount of meat. I have noticed that people eat the exact same amount of meat, regardless of the amount of dairy they eat. And yeah. so it, uh, you can then just end up eating too much. The thing is, is that if you're only eating meat, yeah. Your body, your normal body signals will actually tell you when to stop. Yeah. And so it's very hard to overeat on a carnivore diet because it, it actually gets physically hard to eat it. It stops tasting yeah. good. Yeah. And then eventually it gets repulsive and you're just like, oh, I don't want to do this. Yeah. But people are like, well, I have to finish my meal. I have to finish my plate. You don't have to. You yeah. just eat until it stops tasting good. And if you're eating a whole bunch of dairy, that can change that, that dynamic. And certainly yeah. when you eat carbohydrates, that can change that dynamic because that um, changes your, your, uh, hunger signals. It makes you think you're starving when you're not. Yeah. So a bit of a gray area, but, um, I tend to avoid it. Uh, even though I don't react poorly to dairy, I use butter on my steaks. That's about it. If the steak's too lean and I want to add more fat, I'll, I'll do a thick slice of butter and melt that into my steaks. Okay. So um, what do you cook with butter, butter and ghee? That's what you cook with or what do you use? I would cook with yeah ghee or tallow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah very high smoke point. It's much more stable. You never want to cook with seed oils or the cooking oils. Those yeah. are just God awful. Yeah. So anything, yeah, the cooking oils should not be cooked with yeah. uh, or not ingested at all. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I would just cook. I generally don't cook with butter because I cook at higher heats. Yeah. I like to sort of sear the yeah. sides and, and leave it pretty rare in the middle. Yeah. And so I use ghee or tallow for that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for today. That was so much information. I actually don't know how I'm going to make one blog out of yeah. it. Because it was so much information. Yeah. I almost feel like I want to post this whole video. It was so good. Thank you. Yeah, you can. I can't wait.